but uh, we have a guest for this week, mate. We do. Isn't that exciting? Well, Hi, Tom. <laughs> hey, guys. It, it depends your um, your definition of that and exciting. Do you know the the meme that you see sometimes, like fuck around and find out. <laughs> I feel that I feel that we're just about to find out what happens when you bash an agent for for too long. So how <laughs> how are we, Tom? I'm good. I uh, I'm kind of here to give the other side of the the coin and maybe uh, defend my people. I guess. Yes, yes. So to give you your proper introduction, for we, we had a, damn, a very, very good Damnation Versus uh, podcast together, so some listeners might know you from that episode. Those who don't, you're Tom Taff of the Wasserman Agency. If you don't know what that agency is, if you ever look at a Coachella poster and they do that agency one, it's like Wasserman top to bottom with CEA and a couple other big um, hitters. So you've got the likes of, on that, in that agency, you've got the likes of Billy Elish, Calvin Harris, Kendrick Lamar, I mean, absolutely festival headliners. And then the acts you deal with across our festivals, especially Elder, Battles, Death Heaven, Spanish Love Songs, Beartooth, Paul Bearer, While She Sleeps, The Story So Far. And then you've got maybe outliers for us, like Vance Joy, The Ratings, Julian Baker. So a pretty meaty roster. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely... I, you know, unlikely to appear in a Coachella lineup for the most part anytime soon. But, uh, you know, I think the, we, we basically work under the umbre umbrella and I've always come up through the punk and hardcore scene and, you know, for all my years as an agent, that's what I've worked in and that's how I've met you guys. And, you know, the, the stuff I represent is stuff that I sign because I enjoy it and it's not because it's all about the money. So a lot of my stuff, which I've had for 10 plus years, might never earn huge money, but it's stuff that I love and I'll bother you guys senseless about booking it. Good, good. I've had that. So well, I'm always up for it, Tom, as you know. We, I've had many, many, many uh, <laughs> of your bands over the years, haven't I? And uh, hopefully we continue to do that. And um, Because you, you, uh, you've actually taken on a bunch of bands recently, you know, new bands that are... Uh, that I've booked in the past and now are on your roster like battles and death heaven holding absence. So you, are you, um, are you expanding the roster at the moment? Is that the plan? Um, my personal roster, I mean, it, it does vary. It's kind of, it depends who the band is first and foremost. Like if a band comes along, that's just incredible. You may not see money for it for 10 years, but if you just absolutely fall in love with it, you'll sign it. But for the most part, I don't tend to sign volume. So, you know, the stuff I've got, if you go through my roster, I mean, a lot of that stuff's, I've been there for between five and 17 years. So it's it's kind of, once I'm in there, I try and stay in there for the long haul. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I'm open to options. Um, it doesn't matter about commercial viability, you know, record labels, anything. And the beauty of the world is now, you could be from any country in the world. That's that's kind of half the appeal. Yeah, and you. So, what? what we were, cause this is the first time. Was this episode eight? This is the first time we've had a guest on. So we were like, well, what do we do with that? Do we drop a segment in, in the middle and we kind of we talk gibberish for a bit, of, or do you just come on and be part of the full episode? That we've gone with a latter. So, as part of that, we normally start with a bit of a Q and A from from listeners. So we went to the internet today and said, "Look, we've got an agent on. What would you like to know?" So I've got a couple of questions. James got a couple of questions, and the first one's from a chap by the name of Simon Yarwood. He runs the Uprising Festival down in Leicester, and his first point was, "Tom, speak to me. Give me some bands for next year." <laughs> his question he followed up was, "When he was listening to the Mogwai episode, James made the point of ten years offers." And it transpired that it never got to the band, or at least that was a claim, it never got to the band. And his impression of what he'd been told is all offers get to the band. And he wanted to know what sort of autonomy you have as the agent. Is that true or not? Do all offers go to the band? Or do you have some level of protection to stop the nonsense getting through them? And does that differ band to band? It, it differs band to band. And to be fair, it does differ agent to agent. You know, in my case, every offer will go to the band if they're self-managed. If they if they have a manager, it'll go to the manager. So I can't guarantee if it ever goes to the band themselves. But I think for the most part, the artists I work with 
it's a pretty you know cohesive team in every aspect so i think sometimes there's not one answer here uh, and i think that the role of the agent in music and sports can be similar here that it's easy for us to be the person at the front that takes the hit and sometimes an artist might kind of say like i don't want to come across as a jerk can you just make this go away so that that does happen uh, but at the same time you know offers all go to the artist i mean and it's one of those things in my case where i'm it's difficult to go in and explain to every festival why their offer doesn't make sense you know sometimes the money could be amazing but in terms of timing exclusivity clauses any number of things an amazing offer doesn't actually seem that amazing in the bigger picture what about what about the nonsense though? What about like you know a band's worth twenty grand and they play regularly for twenty grand and somebody comes in and offers two? I mean, do you, are you still obligated to take that to the manager or just about like the nonsense can stay there? I mean, I had today uh, an arena band from America uh, get offered a well, we got and I got an email today from a two hundred capacity venue in regional England, and you know, I mean that that person might. What, you know, I, I can't speculate. I mean, I go back and say they're not available, but I'm not going to e explain why. Uh, and I don't want to be, I don't know that person at all. So I don't yeah. want to talk down to them. I don't want to make them feel stupid or anything like that. So I'll just kind of keep it brief. There's, there's an element, don't you think, that like, I don't know exactly where you started, but me and Gav have talked about where we started. And that was basically at the bottom, not knowing anything. Um, and I guess there's still there are promoters out there doing that, aren't there? They're, they're just like, oh, I'm going to book bring me the horizon for the fleece, and they don't realise that that is not ever going to happen. There's no situation where that works out. Do you do you get a lot of that, like bedroom promoters? You do, but also you've got to be really careful about that because twofold, you don't know who that person's going to become, and I tend to work with a lot of. I, I, you know, I don't work with one promoter for every city or every country. I work with a lot of people because you just don't know who's going to be feeding you the next band that's going to make you a lot of money. And it helps if you are someone who replies to emails, returns phone calls, polite to deal with, all that sort of stuff. Because then Jimmy from this country town in the 200 cab might just give you a hot tip. You know, I mean, like if your muse were a local support band that won a competition in Exeter or something, you know, and that, that, that it essentially happened where the headliner band told the agent, the support band were great. So you just don't know who's going to come from where. And I think it, if I'm polite to them, at least they'll remember that if something happens at the same time, I have promoters. Well, let's talk specifically in the UK who work on the building site during the day and they promote promote shows out of office hours. So you, if they're doing good work by me, then I'll always have their back sort of thing. Do you know, that that's really true because I remember some of the early dealings I had in 2005 and 2006 when I was still trying to feel my way about in some of the condescending replies where I wasn't trying to put Iron Maiden and Jelly's Rock World, but... Some stuff that even when I look back now wasn't that unrealistic, but I just maybe went round, round about it the wrong way and had no reputation. And you get some people that came back and really never gave you the time of day. And we're quite, as I say, condescending about it. And here I am, but it's this almost 20 years later, and it still sits with me, even when I deal with those agents now. Uh, it's not, not that I'm being petty about it, but it still sits with me. Like, you know what? It, it, it's amazing now when you need your band to play my 6,000 capacity main room and they do 60 tickets in a pub how the tables have turned, you know, and that is right. What a, what a great way to tackle it. What a great way to tackle it. I mean, you could see, for example, like when, when we talk about bands for your various festivals, you might think the fee I'm quoting is bonkers, but at least I'll provide you with an argument of how I've got there. So if you're going to give me an argument back, you can at least attack what my points are. It's yeah. not just a case of 50 grand and you just think I'm an idiot. Yeah. And we are, we are, believe me, we are getting there today. That James is going to ask you a question first, for a listener, before we get into the, the deal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've got a question from um, Evan Prendergast, um, who says, what's the best way for a band to approach an agent? 
or does the agent usually approach the balance? I think for the majority of bands I work with, it's either been I've approached them or it's been referral through promoters or other bands uh, in terms of bands kind of tell other friends they're, they, they're happy with you and you get an introduction that way. Um, I think the, and I know you touched on this in the last episode, I don't think that a festival or a support tour is going to make your band, you know, essentially, and, and from an agent's point of view, you have to, even if you're going out and selling a hundred tickets in a 50 mile radius of your town, that is something that's building something where people are paying to come see you. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to be London based. You just have to be doing something in your general area. And I think that's how, you know, I do work with, you know, Aberdeen to Torquay, you know, I'll be hearing about a band doing the good business from promoters. And so I think that that's kind of, I feel it's a little bit more in your control as well. Yeah. Uh, and that's how we hear it from the tips for the most part in the rock and metal world. They're not coming from record labels. It's coming from people who are recommending like something's going on here. You want to get onto it. Yeah. I, I tell you, I've got a band for you. I'm going to tell you about afterwards. Um, definitely. Uh, I got your recommendation. Is that, is that is this what we're doing here? <laughs> Have we got oh, some right bands to recommend? Brilliant. I'm getting in on this as well. <laughs> I've I've got a uh, I've got another question, um, which is a uh, quite a spiky one from uh, a fellow friend of ours, Miles Jelfs, um, who you know, Tom. Um, he said, "Well, he said he said to caveat the question by saying, um, please make sure Tom knows I appreciate his loyalty.'" Um, but th so this question isn't directed at you, but we'd like your, um, or he'd like your thoughts on it. Ask Tom the real reason why national promoters get to steal brands, bands from indie promoters who have, even though the indie promoter has a proven history for the act. So for, for those people at home, um, you, some people like me and Miles will be a promoter in just one city, Bristol. Um, and then there'll be national promoters like Live Nation who'll do a whole tour for a band. And it is a common thing for the bigger nationals to steal the bands off the indies after you've worked the band up, sort of, you know, you've done 100 tickets with them and then the next month, or six months later, you do 600 tickets and then you're doing 1,500 tickets a year later and then you lose the band to Live Nation or um, one of the many other nationals. So, yeah, have you got any insight into that, Tom? I would... I'll try and answer in the best full way possible. So sometimes the nationals are asked to make an offer by me or the manager via me. So you might have the band get to a certain point and the manager wants, or the band might want cohesiveness with one person for the whole country, one marketing person, one kind of whole, whole campaign. You know, when you are, I mean, I I do this all the time, but like a UK tour, if I've got 20 dates, often there's 20 promoters and it it's a, it's a lot more um, hard work in terms of collating marketing and all the bits and bobs and details. So I do understand at some point where artists want, you know, everything the same, one person, really simple, especially if they're touring the world and they, the smallest kind of, detail change becomes frustrating so it's not always you know i think in some respects the nationals would get a bad rap because they're just sitting there and i'm the one asking them to make an offer they yeah. didn't ask for it so that's one thing uh often then other times it can be a, it's a negotiation of you know they whether it be support opportunities you know some of these national promoters don't own festivals so it's not solely a festival discussion but they can bring to the table larger support opportunities to get your band from the academy's level into arenas as a support act. So and the national, other... so, so you're saying the national promoter might leverage the other stuff they're doing, whether that's like a big arena tour with a bigger act or a big festival slot to say, come, come to us, we'll give you this. Is that what you're saying? 
kind of, you know, ultimately at arenas, the artist and their manager will always decide the support. But if the national promoter is asked their opinion and they say, hey, there's this really cool young act, that helps because bands tend to trust their promoters in that respect. So there's those sorts of things. And then obviously the festivals are there and, you know, ultimately the, and, and this isn't just a British thing. This is a global thing in every country in the world, pretty much well, all, you know, a lot of the main ones I'll operate in will have a major handful of festivals and it's a business. And if you want the prime slot, great money, everything they've created, you've got to give something up for that. So that there is something to be said about, you know, they, I mean, you guys risk a huge amount of money every year. You can only imagine the scale of money that some of these bigger festivals risk. There has to be some return for their risk going forward. So it does vary um, at, at different levels, you know, obviously. And it's not just British bands. I mean, I'll have American bands who, you know, will have worked with Miles, will have worked with people for 10 years. And it's, you never get multiple bids, you literally go to the promoter, say, this is the deal, this is the venue we're thinking, tell us your thoughts. And it's the most straightforward deal cutting of all time. Um, and then there's British bands who, you know, find a loyalty in who they like. And I mean, I had it last week where a newish promoter was asking me why he can't get an in with one band, a British band. And my response was, you know, everyone that's been working with them for 10 years has done right by us. Why would we ever change? So I, I, it's kind of one of those things where it's, there's not one answer for it, um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't blame it all on the promoters. I would say that different circumstances, there's different people to blame, you know, if you're an independent. Um, and obviously that's the thing as well. Like you have, you know, great example is, you know, Slam Dunk Festival is an independent festival and they give an awful lot of my bands every year a chance. And they never make it a core term of the deal. But, you know, the expectation is if we do a good job, you'll give us some cities on the next tour and going forward. And that's the, they've done the right thing and they've proven their worth. And Yeah, and, 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 I, good, you know? yeah, and I do that a bunch through 2000 Trees as well. And, the, and, the, and actually the only reason I don't do that to you is because you always work, you already work with like my best mate, Miles. So I'm not going to, trying to steal off miles but when i do that i actually get pushback from agents saying you're you're trying to be like live nation here and it doesn't really sit that it's not really it's not the 2000 trees style so it's a it's quite a tricky one you i've got a festival gav's got a festival but it, i'm not sure how easy that is to leverage i mean clearly we're not download so it's not as easy but, but it's also relationships there you know you, at different companies that um you know, even the, the Live Nations of the world, like those guys started out as DIY promoters, risking their own money. And some of the people at that company, guys and girls, have supported me and my artists for when no one else would. Yeah. They've given me tips on artists when no one else did. Even last week, uh, a size of a lact was looking to change agents and I got recommended to them. So it does kind of... I think that sometimes, even if you said with Wasserman, I think sometimes you could, the, the big company sounds good, but the people there, you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're fans of this genre. And it's a, I think you mentioned it on the last episode, James, like it's a really stressful job. You know, we're not saving lives, but within the context of what we're doing, it is quite stressful. And you're not doing it if you don't love the music. That's yeah. just back to this point. Yeah, and does it ever get sinister though? Does it ever get to the point that in any territory where it's about like you don't play if you don't give us the regional circuit, be it Germany, France, whatever, you're not playing whatever that country's big fest was. They basically just put it as plainly as that. It's like we are strong arming you, it's as clear as that. And if you don't give us those dates from those independent promoters, you're not playing our prime event. I mean, it's, it's, it can be said, but it's never in a sinister way. And ultimately the, the thing is with the rock and metal and punk world across Europe, the 
some of the best festivals to play are run by independents. So I, I don't think there's one big corporation that could, you know, Hellfest is an independent bunch of people. You know, you can't tell these people, they're not going to force an opinion on you, so to speak. So I think that's kind of the the beauty. If it ever became a point where one company owned everything, then that would be challenging. But the beauty is that there might be one dominant festival, but that always springs up three new festivals who are, you know, when you've got newer people with fresh ideas, that's the coolest festivals to play. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not always clear cut as well. Like is the, is the 30 minute slot and download second stage better than the, main support slot in 2000, yeah, 2000 cheese main stage. And I mean, no, everything's clear cut as well. Everything's going to be different per band. So I understand that. Right, we're going to do one more question for, for listeners and then we'll get the boxing gloves on and we'll go to, we'll go to town, all right? So Mark Broadbent, he's asking for an agent's perspective and the difference between a tour show and a festival show. I think what he means is what did it mean to you or your band is like, what was your perspective on the difference? I mean, I think that the, and, and I have this discussion with festivals all the time as when I'm saying the band don't want to do their festival. Uh, and it's simply because at some times, especially, and it doesn't have to be a visual, it helps if it's a, a band with a very visual show or a production heavy show, they want to control the variables. And if you have to change, you know, what do you, at a festival you might get 20 to 30 minutes to change over and you won't get a sound check most of the time. You know, sometimes you'd rather just do an indoor show, control everything yourself, and the fans see exactly what you want, you know, within budget reasons. Um, and then obviously festivals can be different as well because sometimes you just want to see the biggest, most aggressive show possible without the gimmicks. Um, and I think that's, you know, I mean, I think you've got to ask the band the question, are you doing the festival to reach new fans or are you doing the festival to play the fan favorite songs and that's kind of i mean we do go into these discussions to say like what are you looking to get out of this if you're going into a um you know i think you guys spoke about it on the mogwai episode like if they came out and played 15 really obscure songs probably just be you guys enjoying it like there would be a lot of fans who are a bit perplexed why they're not getting the songs they want to hear yeah yeah, absolutely. Do you how what part do you play in that? So you've got uh, especially in your bands, not your exodus or sleeps or high fires that have kind of they know the way in the world and they've probably got their pounds. But you get in your bands coming up and you're a bit like, how much do you offer in opinion when you've got let's use an example, pick, pick one of let's art tangent versus a, a a local Bristol show. And and that and that makes sense the whole you're not gonna get the same sound check at art tangent, you're not gonna get Oh, you're not getting any everything your own way the, the way you would at a, a Bristol headline show that James and Miles might also be putting on. So they come to you and say, "Well, what do you think, Tom? But what's what's your opinions on it?" I, th well, I, I think you even offer an opinion. I mean, we had um, daughters play Art Tangent six years ago, maybe I think it was, and you know, debatable how many tickets they could sell in Bristol at the time. Probably between three hundred and four hundred, I'd say. And they played a pack tent at Art Tangent. It was one of the most in your face sets. They won an awful lot of fans. And I would say that that was a great example of them showing everything they've got. You know, there was no gimmicks of production there, no big video screens or pyro or anything like that. It was just the power of the music. So I think that was a great example of how does a band that's really great, but not enough people know about them get a fan base straight away. But then you'll have another band, you know, about like Every Time I Die, where they're always going to pick up new fans, but their fans kind of see them on the running order and expect, let's get 10 beers in us and get in the pit and have a great time to songs we know. So there's two very different sorts of bands there. I mean, we have done it with Every Time I Die at 2000 Trees before, where it was one particular album. And I still can't remember why we picked that record. Yeah, that, I think it was, it was your, the best it, one. Because <laughs> Hot Dam's the best one. <laughs> you're the only person that said that to me since I booked okay. it, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was your idea, actually. You you um, came to me and said, "Let's if we're going to do it, because basically we, 
if we're going to do a fly-in, because they're not on tour, let's do something special and um, and 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 let's do a record in full. And I, I don't know, I think Hot Damn came from your, either your, well, it came, certainly came through you to me. It might have been from the management or the band, I don't know. Um, so I'll, I'll claim the blame or success there. I, I, I was I was honestly gutted. I don't know why I never got down that year, but I, I mean, if there's one, I didn't know it was a debate. I thought like Hot Damn was just, that is the album. It's got floater on it, isn't it? Hot Damn is the album. So uh, that, was a, that was a shame I never got to see that set. Right, Crash Helmets on, Boxing Gloves. Let's go, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll go through, we'll go via the way that the, the fans have listened to this podcast. So the bollock of Billing was... As we said in the previous episode, it could be one of the ones that could fall flat. Just, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit about Bob? But everyone, apparently, including agents and promoters and fans. So, from the agent's point of view, tell us why it matters. Tell us why it matters so much and in, in, in how some of the horror shows that you've got yourself involved in. I mean, it, it doesn't matter until it matters. And that's my way of answering it without answering. You know, in terms of it is... I don't think you'll speak to any agent who enjoys the billing. And every year with every festival, it's the most nonsense arguments. It's a complete waste of our time, all that sort of stuff. I think that why it matters, there's different ways, obviously. And when I, I said earlier, it doesn't matter till it matters. It's the perception of the band. So in terms of other bands, other managers, other promoters, they see that and not Say you've got a really big band and who are trying to pick a support for their tour. They're not going to go listen to every little band out there. But certainly when they're backstage at festivals, flicking through the posters or walking around a festival, they're going to see the posters and who's high up. And when the discussion comes of who's the hot new thing coming through, if you're in size eight font down the bottom, they're not going to notice that. So it's been used in, in, I've had discussions about supports and stuff where that sort of the argument has come of that band looks like they're doing well, that band's doing well. And you may not have ticket figures to prove it. It's often um, in, when we're negotiating, we often don't have the ticket figures to work with. We are going off what we can find out, social numbers, streaming numbers, you know, we'll call around promoters and see what they have to say about a support to get their local read. You know, what's big in France is not big in the UK sort of thing. So you need to be careful. So it sounds like a bit of a waffle. And that's why I think you have to take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, because whether you appear on the top line or the bottom line really doesn't matter, but it can come up and become a bit of a problem for us. Um, and what you'll find now is, um, particularly a lot of European festivals, the billing is simply the order of that stage on that day or alphabetical. And for me, you look at the old festival posters and there's a, they're unique and it's unique to that festival. It's the vision of that festival. And, you know, you always look at um, levitation in America and stuff like that. It always looks incredible. But now with the alphabetical and stuff, it just looks like copy and paste. So, I mean, I, I really don't like the alphabetical. Um, but, you know, I mean, everyone want you know, you've got to imagine, it, especially in the rock world, for the most part, these bands are grinding it out for years. They want to see a visual representation and not just the band, the manager, the agent, everyone involved want to see a visual representation of, hey, you know what, we started out down here and now we're here. So I think there is that as well. And every now and then it comes up, it might be an ego thing, not the band necessarily. It could be anyone involved in the team who want to be above a certain band. You never know. You know, obviously I had it um, last year where the promoter of a festival called me up and said, you know, this band want to be above your band, even though my band was worth double the tickets. And I called my band up and said, out of respect to their heritage and their name, I think you should just suck it up. And they did. And it's not always the case that happens, but at the same time, like if someone's been around 20, 30 years and has a big name, sometimes you just got to do it. I mean, as, as an as an agent, are you aware 
the other agent the the people you sit by i mean in the office are everyone's doing it differently right so there are i would say of you know me and you've worked together since well at least 2011 probably before that and you rarely call me up on billing but when you do you mean it and and i always do what you ask because you're only coming once a year or not even once a year and we had one this year where you said to me that band's too small that needs to be bigger and they are bigger on the poster now um but there are some agents that will come at you every for every band and it's a just it's a it's an, it's an argument all the time are you do you see that that some people are just t- not doing it the tom taff way there properly yeah definitely i mean i've i've dropped clients because and they're good earners uh, and worth a lot of tickets and money and all that stuff. But every tour, every cycle without becoming bigger, they wanted more money. And you get to the point where you can sense that promoters or festivals are not returning your calls because they think it's about that band. And it's not, it's about five other bands, but when one band's business motive affects other bands in my roster, I have to kind of, think of what's best so if i'm calling up every year trying to grind more money out of you that's not fair or it's a billing thing every time when you see my name on your phone you're probably gonna think twice it's just because it's, it's you don't need that in your life yeah no, I, mean, oh, I totally agree go and, on, you and, go, go. and the first i like that whole uh crime rule thing as well there's, there's certainly something about it. if you get an agent with every single band it's like needs to be higher needs to go on the left needs to go next row why can't we get that low you're a bit like it starts to not only wear thin but then you don't really there's no credibility to their argument you know what i mean whereas you and I haven't had that fight because my villain's always spot on first time. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you get the you get that situation if you do call, you're a bit like, well, this I've got this one wrong. I mean, I've got this one wrong because you're the kind of agent that you're calling that as James says that one time a year or even less so because you're about like, hold on a second. This isn't even about who's getting the most Spotify plays that last month. This is one band on four thousand tickets in London and one done two thousand, and we just it needs to get addressed. And James clearly like, hey, okay, I'm not going to catch everything. It's three hundred bands kicking about. I'm not going to catch everyone and get them spot on if there is even such a thing. So I that say that's true. And also when it comes to the billing, that's interesting what you're saying about bands causing problems for our bands because they're starting to damage your relationship with it with the promoters i mean what's the what's the worst situation you've been in in terms of billing where you've had a band that goes if we don't get that poster tom well we're coming we're coming off the festival kind of thing have you had it as bad as that i mean i haven't probably had it i'm trying to think i don't think i've had it as bad of that i mean ultimately i think if you you know if the band feels strongly about it cancel and that's just it like if if you can't be part of it go away end of the day i mean like they can be disappointed but at the end of the day like it's finding that middle ground and trying to talk some sense into them and i think half the time you can kind of raise the point to the artist that maybe you know what you're asking for is in your opinion the most important thing in the world in the scheme of things really not that important and ultimately um you know, I very uh, last year I had it with an artist where I know for a fact an agent was really aggressively trying to get their artist built above mine, and I heard about it. The promoter called me, and ultimately I spoke to my band and said, "You can go two ways here. You can kick up a massive fuss, or you can make their life easier and just go with it. And if you're a career band, who's that promoter going to look kindly on for five, ten years?" Yeah, you know, I'm not saying you got to kind of roll over all the time, but a bit of common sense makes you a much nicer act to work with. I, I totally agree. And then, but you know, and I don't know if you listened to the whole of that episode, but we were talking about let's say there's two bands on a line next to each other, and you can have like a week long argument about who's on the left and who's on the right. And do, is that something that you that you care about to that level, like? Do you, do you get into that argument? It's not like who's above on the post, it's who's further to the left. And and the second part of that question is there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, right, with the uh, with ticket sales. So if you just if you were just to pick the forum in London, 
which is uh, when it's sold out is what two two thousand four hundred maybe, and but but some sold out forums are like fifteen hundred people, and some sold out forums are two thousand people, and some sold out forums are two thousand four hundred, and it but the promote me the festival promoter has no idea the truth. You know that I mean I'm you you would I'm not accusing you of doing that, but that is a thing that happens a lot. Yeah, and I think it's I mean I've gone into a discussion with the fellow agent at another company and and their argument was well this band is going to go into Wembley Arena and my argument back was okay well my band's going into Wembley Stadium like until you actually do the tickets you can't use that argument it's it's a just a bit of a nonsense thing I think that um you know festivals don't love it um often I say to artists that if you don't love your position on the artwork either post on your social media the um i think you know the artist card which is just your picture on the festival's um template or ultimately artists will have their own artwork with the full tour as long as you're promoting the festival and that you're doing it to your fan base you don't have to actively promote the full lineup that's your decision um, mm -hmm. but ultimately you know it's, it, it can go all day and i mean some of these i've had festivals I don't think I've caused anyone to not announce, but I've heard of a lot of festivals who have, you know, been postponing announcements because of bickering about billing. And um, I would much rather have the right slot on a festival. And, you know, for example, is like, you know, a lot of the European ones, um, they, they, they'll they go right till 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. And they'll all tell me 2 a.m. is a great slot. And I... Don't buy it, you know, because after a day of drinking in the sun, I do not want to be listening to music at 2 a.m. And I've been to these festivals at 2 a.m. and there's a good crowd there. But, you know, give me a 10.30 p.m. act at every day of the week, you know, and if that affects slot on the bill or anything like that, so be it. Because are you doing it for the money or the billing or to grow the band? And you've got to prioritize it. Yeah, and it's, it's so much like because the poster thing, no matter how often we talk about that, that is the it's not a tangible part of the festival. I mean, ultimately, a lot of the problems happen like the band's already agreed the slot, they know who they're above, they know who they're, they know what stage they're on, know who they're above, they know who they're below. The problem comes when you've got a three day festival like James has, is they start arguing about where the build beside the person who's playing the same slot two days afterwards, which is ultimately. It does that doesn't actually mean anything tangible because you're going to go to that festival and play the five pm slot on the main stage. Your argument now is the band that's playing Sunday at five pm on this main stage, which has no impact on you whatsoever, should be to the left and left or right. But I say, I, I mean, it's we made the point when we had that episode that it seemed like something that wasn't really a thing ten years ago, but it has got worse. Definitely got worse from our side of it, and then it's went so far in one direction that so many of these events are now doing A to Z posters. Which I'll say that doesn't really suit anybody. It's fantastic if you're A. E. Williams, but it's terrible if you're Zilinardo. You know what I mean? It's like it's it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Did, did you get the feeling that the bands and managers are seeing that now that Jesus sees A to Z posters are really crap, but then they realise the reason there is an A to Z poster because the promoter it just doesn't have the headspace now to argue with a hundred bands about where they're going to be built. Well, so yeah, I mean they, the bands recognise that. I think that from the promoter's point of view having 100 bands at size 10 font in alphabetical order is not, when you've got millions of euros or pounds at risk, you've got to make some calls. So what you find now is there'll be different tiers of alphabetical. So you'll have something in size 20, something in size 15, because the top bands, why are you paying them top money? You expect them to shift the tickets. And, you know, there is that argument of like at some point, you need to get your money's worth. And and I think if if Johnny Pipsqueak band lower down the bill had a problem with that, you'd rather them just cancel the festival. Yeah, yeah. And it, it tackled uh, tackle point two of uh, the, the this boxing fight, the 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 deal. So you have heard did you listen to the 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 one we had about the dark arts of booking bands? Yeah, I mean I don't I, I would say when we're talking about fees, there's no set fee. Yeah, but there is no set there's no, there's no set feeling. Fair enough. Let's just say we, we accept that. But explain 
Well, explain why to, to start with, and then just talk us through the entire booking process from your side. We've went on at what an hour. We've talked about our side. You tell us your side of the booking process and why it is the way that you guys do it. Well, I think it can be. There's different ways, of course, but like it might be a, it might be a case of the band pick a certain tour period that they want to tour, and we go and work within that period, and source the interest. And you know, there might be key plays. You know, if you're touring in June, you might want download Hellfest Grass Pop for sure. They're the anchors you build around. If you're touring into July, that's when you get. Well, the end of June is outbreak. Start of July is two thousand trees. So it depends on what time you're even available and obviously you do have it's a lot more global now so i'll be trying to beg the band for tour windows to work with um because they've got a global demand now so it's not a case of you might want them for damnation they might have five other tours that tell them they can't tour europe in november so it there's a part of either the band want to tour or i'll go to them and try and justify it a strategy why it makes sense to tour them and, and typically we do have a good you know it's not a, a a detailed strategy but you'd probably have a 12 to 20 month plan of what you want to do with the band and that's kind of what you work towards um then you'll also have you know situations where there's the band aren't intending on touring and you come to me and say hey we want them on damnation figure it out and then suddenly I have to go book a tour around it for it to make sense. So it, it does kind of go both ways. I mean, obviously, the circumstances is why the fees may differ. You know, for example, if if Damnation's the reason the band are coming over and I then need to go and book 10 small shows to help justify it, you'd expect in the discussion to be that Damnation's doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the money from it. And that's you might then come back to me with some restrictions saying, you know, if I'm going to give you this much money, I want you to do this for me, you know, and that's kind of how it all goes. But obviously, you know, if you're talking isolate, like isolated festivals become tricky. And obviously where your three festivals are at helps because there is now obviously festivals through Europe that we can kind of dot to dot between there is a downside to that, though, um, is that, you know, when you're when you've got, you know, let's say in the October, November period, when you've got the best part of 20 bands all driving the same direction on the same days of the week, there's only so many cities in the south of France you can play on a Tuesday night. And that's everyone's cannibalizing each other's business. So that my discussion to the bands would be play some smaller capacities for the smaller fees, but then the festivals have to pick up the slack on the money. And that's, again, it's not like it's, we're not hiding that from the festivals. That would be a discussion I have with festivals. And, and you're one of those agents that, um, uh, some agents don't really like to talk about um, fly-ins. They, they just, I don't know why, they're just not that bothered about it. But we've had, we've done a number of things over the years where it's been like, you've been like, look, the act is not in, they're not in Europe. This is not happening unless we want to look at like flying them in for the weekend and they'll, they'll fly in and out. Um, and I think that's what we did with every time I die. I'm pretty sure we did American football at Arctangent in 2016. Yeah. Um, and this year we've done Spanish love songs. Is that, is that, and it, I feel like they're coming in just for that and going, or is that, have I forgotten that? And that's it wrong. started. I think we started by getting, this is where we find out Tom's broken my exclusivity no, live yeah. on there. <laughs> hey, I've, I've got written proof of this, man. But I think basically what happened, we got, we had an offer from you to do it. And then it was a case of how do we make this work? We had a few European festivals come in and it was like, okay, maybe we can piece something together. But keep in mind, the band has just done a headline tour through Jan, Feb. So a lot of the key cities who would play are gone. And ultimately then what we did was we, there's a few headline shows across Europe, a few support shows. They're doing a few supports to Gaslight Anthem. Um, and and then we're going to do two nights in London at a small room to play a record that basically came out just before the pandemic. So a lot of the fans have never heard that record live. So it allowed us to basically build something out of nothing. So I think the two reasons that tour got created 
was the 2000 trees offer and the support offer for Gaslight Anthem in Notting. And out of that built a two and a half week tour. Yeah. And we also talked a bunch about um, the, the, the lineup that was at 2000 trees this year was like, if Spanish love songs were going to play, it felt like the year they should play because they wanted to play with, I guess, Gaslight and Manchester Orchestra. And we also had a conversation about the Menzingers as well. So I think people, which was the same conversation, which was like, the Menzingers should be on this lineup, right? You, I think the manager contacted you and said, I've just seen the 2000 Trees lineup. We should get the Menzingers on it. And we, you know, it ultimately didn't work out, but you're also one of those agents that will look at that sort of thing. You're really, that's quite a detailed focus, right? Well, yeah, I think at that time, I, I think my call to you was, have you got any money left? And can I have it? And and I think you had pretty much spent the budget and I was trying to come up with interesting concepts of what they could do for you to break the bank to somehow... We had we had a great plan for the Menzingers. Yeah. Anyway. I'm gutted it didn't happen. <laughs> I'm, honestly, I feel I feel you, you're, you're duped there, Tom, because he clearly uh, doesn't, have <laughs> budget, he doesn't have any restriction in his budget. Just be more quiet. It seems to be the answer. <laughs> well, we, we had a plan it was you know even about we're talking about you know where they could play because of people walking you know the, it got to the point of like moving between stages and why they would have an amazing result and and it wasn't part of it was to grow the band but at the same time it was i knew that you'd have a festival this year full of their fans already people would genuinely love the moment so it'd be a, it'd be a great opportunity for the fans and the band and that's, you know, a lot of the time with artists, when you have those performances where it really lets reminds them why they do it. It, it buys you energy for five years. Yeah. yeah we'll go 2025 then. Exactly. <laughs> you, you heard it here first, and there are two, two promoters and an agent <laughs> pod exclusive. Menzingers for 2003, 2025. Magic. So, uh, to wrap up the booking process, because one of the big one of the big bugbears that promoters have always got is like you guys hold all the information, you've got all the answers. Yet you come to the promoter, or even if the promoter goes to you and and they initiate the conversation, it's about like making an offer, and then it's that whole way uh, wild west standoff. Or the promoter's not quite sure are they going to lowball you, are they going to offend you in the band? Because let's you, you're quite a straight shooter to be fair. Pardon the pun, but the you get people that do are either very offended or the least act like they're offended, and that's when you've done this for twenty years as well. That gets a bit tiring when you get somebody saying, "Are you stupid? This band's worth four times what you've offered." Like, I'm only guessing. I mean, I'm guessing, mate. So, what's what's your thoughts on that? Why is it that you've hold all the cards but we don't get to see them? I think some, you know, potentially, I'm going. I thought it would be maybe they're going to throw a crazy money offer out there. And it's that whole, you'll never know. But at the same time, you know, I, I will see the, I, I sat in front of a European promoter three, four weeks ago, and they asked me what I thought a band should get paid. And when I set a figure, I could see their, you know, eyes sort of flicker a bit. They didn't know what planet I was on. And I kind of could read that body sign and explain why, you know, when, when you, uh, in this case, if you have to fly to the festival, often with the way that flights are, luggage is lost, you lose a travel day either side. So you, you lose days that the band can be working elsewhere. So there's things like that I can explain why a fee, you're paying a premium and that sort of stuff. Um, but also there's that point of, if I'm kind of, if I come in with a high fee to you, I'll be saying, I've heard the record, I know the plan, I think this is going to really take off. You don't need to book the band, but, and if you think my fee's insane, so be it. But it does happen where by the time it comes to show day, promoters actually say, I think I've got a deal here. So it's, it, it does go both ways. I think from my point of view, for the most part, I will come in with an expected fee and justify why. And I would quote tickets. And I think the tricky thing is if, I think we've said this before, Gav, with, with Damnation was like, if I gave you a London ticket figure, you'd say, but what about the Leeds one? What about the Manchester one? And then I would counter that with, depending on how exclusive they are, you, if it's a UK exclusive, my London figures come into that because obviously people are traveling. 
So I think it does depend on, you know, 100% of people from the London show are not traveling to Manchester, but there's something to it that deserves a bit of more money. Yeah, if you've got if you've got it to yourself, and I think James and I both recognise that festivals do pay, pay a premium, and there's a bit of that just because it's the how awkward you're making it for the band because we've discussed that earlier on this episode that bands want to show up, they want a two-hour sound check, they want their ninety-minute headline slot, they want the supports that they want and them off the stage, and we're offering none of that. We're offering the opposite of a uh, twenty-five-minute line checks and yeah, getting squeezed into forty-five minutes in the third tent. So I, I mean, the, the premium is. Uh, is accepted. When you mention the band fees, though, uh, are James and I right that they have absolutely skyrocketed? I mean, across the board, this isn't about your bands, but skyrocketed across the board post-pandemic, and in a lot of cases, without anything really changing for the band in question. Yeah, uh, but also, I mean, I, I'll i give you an example. I've got a, a band that's been coming to, an American band that comes to the UK. I mean, they had been coming yearly, maybe twice a year, from 2006 and last year they said to me you know we're gonna have to if you want us to tour in the summer months you're gonna have to get us double the money you've got us before and they did then quickly say we don't expect that but they went to say in the summer months all the costs go up flights go up the buses double the crew expectation you know a lot of crew members a lot of good crew members left the business in the pandemic so good crew members want better wages because the cost of living has gone up and everything for the band members, you know, you've got the taxes. I mean, these bands get hit with some brutal taxes across Europe as well. So in Germany, it's the best part of 25% of the fee straight to the government. You know, that's all that sort of stuff does impact them. So I think that they're finding ways to make the budgets work. And obviously it does differ festival to festival, but if you look at the big, 60 to 80,000 cap festivals. Typically you can sell one item of merch. And I remember going to Grass Pop in Belgium with Nails and I think they sold one t-shirt and that was it. And it was kind of just, you know, that a lot of these bands sell more merch than their actual show fee. So if you're doing a festival selling one t-shirt, you need to make up that money somewhere else. And that's, and not, a lot of these bands aren't on, really nice buses i mean if you see some of the vans these guys travel in it's it's a certain lifestyle that's for sure yeah um, i mean it did to jump in then just on the, on the merch point is that is that a big selling point for for damnation and because you're, you're you're completely right there's bands that will play for two grand at damnation who take three and a half grand that day in merch and and they walk away with all so i've always felt that that's something that's never even right back to the deal we've done today, the, the agent came and said, okay, what's the, the merch terms? And we're like, like, you guys show up, you sell it, you take it. And they're like, right, great. But I don't feel like it gets back to enough bands as well, considering how important it is. If you're, if you're saying to an agent who goes, oh, I can get six grand playing a club show in Manchester and you're only offering me seven grand for Damnation and I need to get, and I need to put up all the bullshit playing Damnation rather than just having their own club academy show. And I'm like, I know, but also the merch, to 6,000 people, I mean, like, but, but I mean, can, likes of Converge and Alexi Wizard doing same figures with our merch. So is that something that you feel that bands are taking into account when it's coming, or is it just one of those ones they kind of find out on a day? I mean, it's definitely got around with without break and with Slam Dunk in, in, when you talk British festivals. Like, a lot of those bands, I bet, I mean, a handful of bands I've worked with on those festivals would basically pay for their airfares out of merch sales alone. You know, so it and, they tell their friends that, and then those festivals develop good reputations. So I think that might be the sales point for doing those festivals. But at the same time, you look at, you might do terrible merch download, but what I've had some bands who have had probably the most memorable show of their career at download. And that goes on to become a talking point for years to come for that band. Or, I mean, I, I don't book Trivium, but when you talk about slots on festivals, I bore the guys at the festival sense because that maybe in the last 10 years, there was a main stage slot around 3 p.m. that Trivium did. And it was one of the biggest crowds for a day show I've ever seen. And I keep pushing them. I want that slot. That's the one I want. And I must look like an absolute weirdo, but it's the right timing, the right moment in the afternoon. 
that's what I want. So you like, any- I, I want my band down the bill. Move two slots down. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, you know, obviously you've got to kind of go into it of if we're, you know, who who is going to a festival to buy five T-shirts? Probably not many people. You're going to pick your one or two and you'll you'll go from there. But, I mean, I think that you've got to talk to these bands and managers about what are you trying to get out of this? But certainly if you're a festival that's, you know, typically the best merch selling festivals are the ones that are a bit more niche You know, if it's just, a, you know, Reading and Leeds, like that appeals to everyone in the world. So you you might not sell much merch there because how many I has for one particular genre are going? Yeah. yeah, I mean, what one thing I I wanted to kind of just slightly rewind a little bit on is, do you think I, I, in one of our episodes we kind of talked about the idea that agents um, have some responsibility not to not to rip off festivals or to increase fees to a to a level where, it, you know, we've got festivals going bust left, right and centre. And no doubt we will talk about that on a future episode about why that is. Do you feel that, so an agent, let's, well, let's just talk about 2000 Trees and you. Do you feel that, you you know, you've had tens of bookings over the years. Do you feel any responsibility to a festival like that, that you work with regularly, not to, I don't know, is is it, is it, can you rip off a festival or if they're prepared to pay it, it's just fair game? I don't know. Do you, do, you, do you see what I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, I think that the 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 bookings are, like, I guess the relationship builds over time. So you and I can have a discussion about why I think a band's worth something. You can counter that. We go back and forth and we get to a point where we both go, I'm, I'll, I'll live with that, Right. But that's built over over time, and I know you take care of the bands, and you you're not walking away thinking he really stung me there. Obviously, at some point you've got to work with someone for the first time, and I've had I think it was last summer a promoter in Spain who I, I've worked with for a long time, but he offered double what the band were worth for a club show in the summer, and I don't know if it was out of loyalty to me or something else. And I had to go back and say, like, listen, on a Monday night, you're going to lose a lot of money if this is the offer. Like, go away and think about it. Because I basically go and say, this is going to do 200 tickets. Why don't you do an offer based on 200 tickets? And it's just amazing because I tell you why I don't want headaches. And I know that's not going to sell. So I'm creating a headache for myself down the track. And, and that's what, like, we had it as a company a few weeks ago where a promoter wanted to put an artist into a insanely big venue and the agents had to tell the promoter that's bonkers and to, you know, go into something 30% the size because that's where we're trying to avoid, you know, ultimately if we confirm it with the artist, they want to get paid and it becomes a headache for us when the promoter doesn't want to pay or anything like that. So I think that, where you get stuck is the reunion business. And I mean, I've had that over the years where a band reunites, they're not even a headliner, but the festival gets caught up in the name and they'll pay a fortune for it. And the band aren't really even worth the tickets. And I think there's two bands that I can think of where, and fortunately we're both with club shows, but I think I hold the record for those promoters worst ever losses on those shows of their whole career, mind you. So, you know, they were happy to take the hit, but at the same time, I work with them for 10 years. So the money I've built up over time of profit can help offset that. But, you know, that's the thing when when people come in with reunions. I generally now, as an agent, I've done a number of them, but I'm shying away from doing many more because it's such a gray area. You know, and I know yeah. sometimes with festivals you need, you know, that secret source that makes you different to the others, but it, it comes down to when to walk away as a promoter. Yeah, I mean, that's that's surely the Dillinger Escape Plan episode in a capsule. You know, it's uh, everyone wants them. Everyone wants them. But ultimately, are you going to bet the house on it that everyone's going to show up? 
because it's no, it's not a done deal. Uh, the box was the other one refused before that. James talked about the driving, albeit the refused and out of driving shows were relatively successful. But James doesn't even know at this point. It was like that were two thousand trees and out of driving. The big factor in those years being successful, or did he just pay to get bands he loved and it was going to be successful regardless? So that's a uh, that's interesting. And I tell you what, when you when you roll the dice on those reunion shows, I think the promoter and the agent need to basically you're gambling aren't you and you need you need to stand by it what was really fascinating about what you were saying there is taking the fees that are so overinflated and that is an agent fault to promote for that that it becomes almost ridiculous uh, to the point of the damaging the, the deposits never paid the event never happens the agent doesn't get paid the manager doesn't get paid the whole thing's a farce, and that's happened now a few times in the UK. It's have you managed to dodge a lot of that? I mean, as James saying as well about the, the, the events are collapsing and tickets he was looking through. Have you managed to navigate your way through that without too many your dominions, your temples, heavy Scotland's uh, manor fests? Have you managed to get out the other side where basically looking back to abandon saying, I know we got offered 50 grand and we'll, we'll do five, but we're not getting anything because ultimately those events are gone. I've, I've avoided most of those problems for the most part. And I think there's kind of one easy rule with this, that if you're a promoter that springs up with a festival with no track record, that's a red flag. If you're a promoter that has been doing 200 to 500 cap shows for a period of time, you've earned a trust, you've earned some goodwill. I know that you know what you're doing. You know, that's where if someone comes to me with a, a big checkbook and big dreams but they've never done it before then that's a concern i mean i've had festivals before in that situation and i've encouraged them to partner with an established promoter to guide them through the process because they might have the best of intentions in the world but at a certain scale your innocent rookie mistakes are going to be very costly so i think you need to again if you're starting a brand new festival in leicester Start with bands that can sell a 500 cap, build it up over time because that's like, as an agent, I learned my trade on small bands that the mistakes I made weren't going to be life or death. And I think that's the, I mean, I was a promoter many moons ago and it's a, it's a difficult game. You know, I made a lot of money and then I believed the British rock press and paid way too much for a band and I lost all my profit. But, you know, the most important thing was the day after the tour finished, I paid the band their full fee and licked my wounds and vowed that I'd never be a promoter again. <laughs> why, <laughs> why, why, did we, why didn't we lick our wounds, James? <laughs> yeah, we're not, well, we're getting there, mate, I think. <laughs> I mean, how, how do you see the, the market, Tom? Like the, I don't know, the, the touring market and the festival market in the UK, do you... Um, Obviously, we're a f few years post-COVID now. You and I talked a bunch privately during COVID um, about how hard it was going to be to come back. But do you, do you think we're in a... Do you feel bullish or do you feel n nervous? Or where, where are we, do you think, in the UK? I, I'm, 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 I'm optimistic about it all. I think that it's... And I think as a global thing, to be honest, there is so many ways to spend your money. And I, I'm not suggesting that tickets for club shows and that are cheap, but comparing to other social activities, they're cheaper than they probably should be. And, but that's fine. I think that when people suggest that the music industry is booming, it's probably using figures like you should probably discount Taylor Swift and Ed Sheeran, because I think um, if you follow music venues trust, there was some stat about, I'm going to completely go off, get the wrong figure here, but it's on their social media. I think something like 20 venues in Scotland alone closed down last year that do music. And it's it's through lack of support from, I mean, we don't even need to get into the lack of government support, but, you know, in terms of the scene itself and people going out, and I think that specific to the pandemic question, I think that people's habits have changed a little bit and, Certainly, you know, 
early 2000s, you'd be going out four nights a week and you'd pay your five to seven pounds just to, you might not even know the band's playing, but it was such a nominal figure to give away to drink and listen to music in a bar that you probably, you know, a rock bar, you know, you're going to like generally what they've got. So for me, a lot of what I tell my artists comes down to value for money. You know, the days of, I mean, I never really liked it, but the days of having a big headliner with a really terrible local support, you know, that's probably gone. I think I really try and focus on people need to look at your lineup and go, okay, for my limited funds, that's where I'm spending my money. And that's kind of where, you know, if you go back 10, 15 years, I could bring an American band through the year three times a year. Now it's kind of probably once every 12 to 14 months. Like it's it's becoming less and less because you are trying to let people miss the bands. When they come, they all come out in force. Yeah, I mean, that, that's true. And it's, it's strange because I feel like there's, there's this weird contrast going on at the minute where you're getting your likes of your suffocation and your cattle decapitation and um, these, especially death metal shows, was it uh, Orbit Culture? I, mean, I don't even really know what the Orbit Culture was. Selling out these venues, they, they weren't selling it a few years ago, but then you're going to some shows where maybe the band would have done six or seven tickets and they're doing seven. So it's like, it's like, you know what? I'm going to go to a gig, but it's going to be cattle decapitation and that's all I'm going to that week, or enslaved and that's all I'm going to, but I'm going to miss out in the gig that I probably would have went to for a tenor beforehand. So it's odd because in some ways I'm like, my God, sleep token are selling at arenas and a bath's now going to go and try venues that are 12, 1300 capacity. And I like, this is amazing. We're all selling, I mean, even Damnation's doing pretty well this year. And you're like, this is this is great. But then when I speak to agents to get some of the horror stories about like, shit, that was a small band that thought we're going to do that, but I've really, we're just going to pull the tour. So I, it's easy. I mean, forget Taylor Swift and Ed Sheeran. It's, it's easy to get caught up in some of the success stories and then no see just how bad it is for, for some of the smaller bands. But also you think of the experience and, and you know, obviously not everyone's got different levels of income, but I, de I definitely, you know, for example, if I go to 2000 Trees and there is some really great quality locally produced beer and food, I would probably pay a premium for the experience because that over mass produced awful lager isn't what I'm after. So I think it's, if the festivals that get it right, I think it becomes more of an experience and, and you enjoy it, I guess it's plus the band. I mean, it's genuinely people probably will be prioritizing your festivals over going to seven or eight gigs. Yeah. Which is just good. Good. <laughs> we'll, take we'll, we'll take that. <laughs> Please do. Because we'd like that festival to be here next year also. <laughs> so, I mean, we knew this one was going to run a run a wee bit longer, but we'll, um, to wrap up this this segment, then we'll come at us, Tom. We'll say, what could Damnation, 2000 Trees and Art Tangent do better? And there must be something. Don't, don't, be, don't be on the fence with this one. What can we do better? Well, okay. I did write a list here. <laughs> I didn't even a list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I really wish 2000 Trees was two weeks earlier because it would fit my schedule a lot better. Would it? Would it be uh, easier for me to book bands all around? Is that? Is that the? Actually, the it would. It really would. Do you know why? Because where it falls now, a lot of the, a lot of the festivals that, the bands I'd present you are, typically would finish their run around June 30. So to, for me to create that extra week, you know, and, and more and more it doesn't matter of the age demographic of the band the, there is a limited tour frame. So I'm not getting six week tours anymore. It's two and a half, three weeks. So if I have to create an extra week of income so they can play 2000 trees, that puts a burden on you to pay a certain fee and me to somehow find those shows in early July that will work. So I think that's, you know, again, that would help me. But at the same time, when you get into those June, those June weekends, it's a real, you know, crazy time of logistics of bands driving around and stuff and potentially bidding higher to win that date, you know. And I think the the problem that both you guys have with all three festivals is the borders. You know, we I used to easily be able to go Belgium to the UK back to back without a problem. Now with the delays at the borders, 
I, if I can, there's always a travel day. So it's kind of one of those things where if you're falling on a festival weekend where there's stuff in Belgium or France or wherever, uh, I need to, to, to make the UK work. I need to then basically not do their show. And that's potentially a, that would be a more profitable show to play because it's smaller drive money's right there. So I think those things are obviously out of your control, but I don't necessarily think that people on the internet always realize some of the logistical hurdles we have to go through. No, absolutely. But there's also an element for me of the, in June, you know, people have spent their money at download. There's a lot of people that go to download and 2000 trees and, you know, the closer you get, the less likely they are. They'll choose one or the other and outbreak as well. It's, so it's, it's a tricky one, the dates, I think. Well, and then um, I was going to say, Gab with Damnation, you've obviously got a lot of similar, a lot of people with the same idea around Europe booking in the same time frame as you, which is good because then you can kind of appeal to more bands to create a bit of a tour. How do you then stand out above the pack? Because I guess you possibly rely on people flying in to your one over theirs. Absolutely. I mean, we, we discussed this a wee bit previously as well. I mean, the UK exclusives, we went quite heavy in them yesterday, last year, and they, those are expensive buggers, you know what I mean? So you can, the, the thousands start dwindling very quickly when you're putting that exclusive tag in it. And and you try, I mean, ultimately, I, I think that, I mean, the, the bleeding through is a European exclusive, almost by default, and they're just flying in and flying back out. I don't know what the situation is with Niels, uh, possibly. A European exclusive. We've done those album sets last year for your like saying Slaves and your Leprous and Catatonas that were all well, some of them were world exclusive. You know what I mean? It was like the only place. So there is a there is a desperation there to try because I said that to James as well. These bands that we are booking are not playing even three thousand capacity rooms and selling them out. So it put them in a six thousand capacity arena. You need every one of them to be playing their part. You need them all to be to be trying to do that. So yeah, I mean, but then it's it's, it's the balance of Let's go to every band that's on the bill and say, well, you can be a European exclusive. Like, I agree, we will, but we'll play for 500, but now we want 10 grand. You know what I mean? Because that's what it's going to take if you're going to rule out the rest of Europe. So it's a it's a balancing act. And you can get some years, we've kind of managed to fill the place without really drilling down on that. And some years, we, or the last year, for example, we didn't. And it didn't do so well. So still try to figure that out for ourselves. I mean, if you've got any... Any your two pens you'd like to throw at that? But you, how you could do that balance act better? I'm all ears. I think also that the the trick thing. I mean, we have with with the Menzing is like the the record. Well, one of the records I love the most is one of the early records. And if I've ever brought up, why don't you play that in full? The response is, you know, you and three people are going to like it. So I think that it's the tricky thing with records in full because it's a it's a good point of difference. And it plays into what I said about reunions in general. Like it's, it gives you something fresh for your lineup each year. Um, but then I would just, yeah, it's 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 a risk, isn't it? You know, I think that's the the thing. I was going to say then. So with uh, how much thought do you guys put into things like food and beer, or are you selling it off to companies to handle it for you? No, it's um, so. We we do sell off our beer rights, but me and my brother spent a whole day look, a few weeks ago touring the breweries of Bristol. Like all the Bristol's got so many amazing breweries, and uh, we literally went and tasted the beer and picked the one that we liked the most. So there is a money bit to it, but it's it's about quality for the customer. It's it's the number one thing, and and the food. Um, Danielle books all the food at, at both our festivals and. She spends like months, like getting a, a brilliant selection of like really, you know, everyone nowadays, like there's so many different requirements people have with food and we try to cater to all of them. So yeah, she like massive amount of time is put into that. And I, to be honest, that's why uh, 2000 Trees has been successful, I think, is because we, we give a shit about the details when the bigger festivals don't. Um, it's not just bands, it's the other stuff. Yeah. what's the one um what's the one technique if i come to you or an agent comes to you guys am i having a negotiation and sometimes you'd be like fair enough i'll give that to you what's the one thing i could do to make you dig your heels in 
to just be like, no, mate, I'm going to do whatever I can just to annoy you and not give you what you want. Well, well, it's that 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 has to take that takes place over a period of years, actually. So there are some agents that are always trying to screw you over. There are hundred, they hundred percent are, and eventually over anymore. But that's not that's not what you're like. So I just I think it's an unlikely. Uh, it doesn't feel like that's something that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, yeah, you, you don't you don't want to feel bumped. I mean, you, usually the even though every agents and every promoters. Um, the way they handle a booking, it can be different. It's ultimately the same thing when it gets down to the brass tax or the money going to the band, ultimately, and, and you guys getting your cut. But I definitely, as James says, I, I, I haven't been screwed over quite as often as James has, and that's probably the ratio of bands he books, the ratio of bands I book. But, I mean, I would I would not take kindly to agreeing a deal that we've haggled over for a long time for that not to be the deal that panned out, like, in terms of exclusivity, what else was happening with the band. I mean, you, I mean people are talking about this Cradle of Filth set, and even yesterday, we're going, will they really be doing the old school set, and will they do this, and what will Danny do? Like, let's be fair, when he goes on stage, he can go out and sing Happy Birthday for all, all the control I've got, and I mean, I'm not going to run on stage and, and, like, slide tackle him, so... But the, the thing is, that's the deal. The deal was done with that agent, and that's what I've been promised, and that's what Kedar Filth are promoting. So why wouldn't it be an old-school ritual, you know what I mean? So, I mean, if I, if, I, if Danny Filth does go on stage and sing Happy Birthday instead of saw her ghost in the fog, I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a problem with that agent and that band, and I'm not gonna be booked again. There's ministry for it, for example. This make no that this is the Marco for Avocados fault, but ministry based on a whole tour on a ridiculous offer they're going to get in Belgium that festival fell through then they get ripped off uh, Damnation and it it wasn't even as much of, of a oh by the way we'll make it up to you or whatever like I'm in no hurry to ever work with Ministry again I mean I work with Marco again but no hurry to work with, with Ministry again as well like sometimes it's just about common decency and it's weird because when we were thinking about what agent would work with us this was pure luck that you got in touch with email and said, what's well, the agent bashing? <laughs> because <laughs> wait, 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 to, to make this podcast work, it had to be an agent that represented bands across all three festivals. But also, what was good about this was we knew we were going to come on and be quite forthright. And also, there was something that really stuck out with you that was a wee touch of class that you don't often see uh, in these kind of dealings. And does the whole myth us always fighting each other? No good whatsoever. But... We booked Paul Bearer, Elder and the Iris package and you booked that with Damnation and it was going through the whole of the UK so there was zero exclusivity. In fact, I think they were playing 10 yards for Damnation the following day. There was that yeah. many shows. But then, <laughs> but then they were getting booked for, for 2000, no, 2003's Art Tangent and you dropped many and you know and goes, by the way, they're doing Art Tangent. I know you and James got on well but just to get a heads up that they're going to be doing that as well. Nine times out of ten and that, that had nothing to do with it. You, you had no, there was no reason to to say that other than just being professional courtesy and a bit of respect showing I know they're on your festival you're going to see them announced for another poster and it's, it's your mate's but it's your mate's festival as well so just so you know kind of thing and I thought you know what the amount of times that I don't get that the amount of times that I just see it on a poster and you're a bit like fucking hell it'd be good to have a heads up I mean it'd be good we're we're promoting as far as I know Paul Bearer are doing their show and not coming back to the UK at all. And then here it is that. So it was that was just one but one thing I was saying. I'll, I'll make sure I mention that on the podcast as well because you're right, there's there's plenty that agents and fucking then can do to piss each other off, but there's also a good side to this business and, and when it works well, it can work well also. I mean, I had um it hasn't happened that all that often, but I had a British band probably two years ago, and I wanted to do about six of the smaller festivals around the country. And everyone, when I mentioned that kind of raised the eyebrow and I basically said to them all, if you all pay exactly the same fee, would that work? And they all agreed to it. And I think that in that instance, the band were being paid exactly what they're worth, but everyone felt they were getting a good, like a, a fair deal. If it comes out that you're paying 10 grand more than someone else, like people do talk. And I think that's where, um, you know, and again, like I get asked sometimes by bands and managers, which I think you've spoken about before to, you know, say we've got the offer and you get said, Hey, like just ask the promoter if they'll offer another four grand so we can confirm. And that's, you'll do it, 
because you've been asked to do it, but you kind of have to laugh at the whole concept of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that deal that you just talked about was I was involved with, um, without naming the band, obviously, but, but it was a good deal. And because actually sometimes as a festival, you would rather pay less and have less exclusivity. You don't, if, you've, if you're me and you've got 150 bands at 2000 Trees and 150 at Arc Tangent, you don't want exclusivity everywhere and because you can't afford it, basically. So yeah, I, I thought that was a great way and a, an unusual plan you made there. I thought it's to, to just be like, well, there's a bunch of festivals in the UK that this act work on, let's get them to play them all. Um, I mean, look, I have it this year with, um, with, with a band who are playing download and the exclusivity wouldn't allow us to do anything else, but the band really wanted to do a outdoor hometown show. And, you know, I, I went to Andy and asked him the question and, and he came back straight away and was just, you know, because we haven't been ridiculous with the fee request and the negotiation in general, he was more than happy to allow a British band to do some of that because it's good for their growth. You know, and I think that's where, again, in, in this case, Live Nation's part of the, um, in some cities at least, is part of the promoting team. And obviously, James, you and Miles are also involved in, in Bristol. So I think there is a, if you're kind of going to call a festival out for being harsh on exclusivity, it does relate to the deal you've cut as the agent as well. And I think everything, if you've been reasonable with your request, then more times than not, festivals will be, you know, fairly nice back. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. I think we probably edit out the nice bits about Live Nation. Um, <laughs> Those always. <laughs> but it just, it just kept freezing when, uh, when Tom was being really nice and yeah. <laughs> It's got to go. It's hard to, because I'm so friendly with Cam as well. And then James, James keeps coming on and trying to, like, uh, no, no, it was, it I'm friendly with Cam as well. I am friendly with Cam, just Cam's to be a clear. Legend. Cam, <laughs> Cam's a legend. So, uh, I, bef- right, is there any, can tell, tell us a horror story, because right? you, you have been very fair, you have uh, been very balanced for us, and I understand a bit more uh, the, the picture. The listeners will enjoy the fact you've been like that too, but you might, there must be a horror story there. I mean, without naming any events or the bands involved, there must be a time where, like, this is why the contract's like that, this is why we make these demands, this is why it has to be like this, because if you don't, this can happen. Well, the, the, I've got two, because one's just that ridiculous that sometimes you have to hold your hands up because the contract means nothing. You know, so obviously I was about to get on a plane in Berlin and I had Black Dahlia Murder due to arrive into China to start a tour. And the band, the promoter had been okay, but we, you know, we got a deposit, but not the whole amount. And the band and their crew texted me saying like, Hey, we're at the airport. We've been here for four hours. No one's here to meet us. What do we do? And I'm at that point where I'm on the plane about to lose signal. And you kind of have to just throw your hands up in the air and hope that it figures itself out. <laughs> you know? But someone did turn up at the airport. I think in total it was six hours late uh, and they bl- blamed bad traffic. Right, so, okay. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, you know, the other with festivals, it is, there is that point where you will have, um, and this comes down to experience, you'll have bands who turn up and you'll get the call and say like, the... The this, this stage is really not fit for purpose in terms of the whatever it's made out of or the, secu- the the health and safety of it all. And you have to say to the band, like, you're contractually protected here that if it doesn't meet certain safety standards, you don't have to go on that stage. And I think that's really important that we would hold the promoter to those standards because I wouldn't want something happening on me telling a band to do something and and the contract's there to protect us in that instance. But, you know, I think for the most part, um, I think James, you mentioned this the other week and the, a lot of the big promoters and festivals, you know, there is a, a festival body around Europe who represents maybe 70 plus festivals and they have an, a, they're all independent festivals, mind you. And they have an agreed terms and conditions that they, they send out basically. So they at least, work together and everyone as in the agencies have agreed to those terms so i think there is a sense of fairness in return but ultimately 
if I'm ever to use the terms in a contract, it's you can read through a five page contract and there's maybe five lines that really matter. Um, but those other things are there if I need them. It's yeah. just, I mean, you know, the, the billing, if someone puts like a hundred percent billing or anything in the thing, most promoters, if they ever return the contract, scribble that out straight away. You know, there's those things where you do every now and then get a promoter, just looking to wind you up and just send back a contract with a million markups. And presumably it's the case that, um, there is not enough time at any given booking agency to chase all the contracts. So you just, they're sent out and then you never really know who got around to signing them, presumably. Well, it's on a trust basis as well. Like if I don't know the promoter, I'll want the money up front. But at the same time, if you're someone that I've worked with for years, I, you know, and, and I do understand that's frustrating for young promoters and festivals that they might feel they'll get a fair go. But if you're someone who's, built up a body of work for many years that that's that you know I, there's people like promoters and festivals i'll call up who have had my back for a long time or if i've got a problem they'll solve it or vice versa you know there are those sorts of things so um i mean look we've had it where festivals have been losing a chunk of money and they'll call up and say like is there anything we can do here like how can we you know they're not going to ask me to do something against the band's wishes, but I'll certainly get creative and do what I can to help them out. Yeah, and I suppose you can always come down to, hey, look, this is financially to the point that we could have to pull the plug here. And well, you guys have already 10, 15, 20 bands are already due to come into Berlin. And if we can't get creative with some of it, on everyone's blessing. I mean, no try to take money out of an agent or a manager or a band's pocket, but ultimately if there's no show... Who does that suit? You know what I mean? So, we're wrapping this up with two final things. Firstly, I want to know personally, are the ratings suitable to headline 2000 Trees? I feel that they are. Am I the only person in this conversation that thinks that? You know what? The, the, the manager sent me a text message about two weeks ago and said, could you ever see us on this festival? What did you say? And no. <laughs> I responded, I think you're crazy. So maybe now he might hear about this and think that I'm the crazy one and we should do a deal. Did I mean, uh, 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 James Mano get the right feel for No, you him? haven't. Listen, mate, you need to come to 2000 Trees this year because you sent me a load of bands the other day and I was like, none of these are suitable. They're all suitable. You, you've not all got suitable. the... Basically... Would they be? Would the Radio One Rock Show play them? Would Would Kerrang or Rock Sound Magazine feature them? If the answer is no, they're probably not a Two Thousand Trees band. But Manchester I mean, Orchestra have never been in Kerrang. Have yeah, they, they have. They have. They have. You're at it. Manchester Orchestra have been in Kerrang. Of course they have. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, when you're when you're at Two Thousand Trees, twenty twenty five, twenty twenty six, and you're watching the ratings. <laughs> you know, this is where the, the scene and I'll talk about some of these bands right because I want to hear this in the comments right about how right I am the streaks massive attack who else did we say that was in there these, these bands are fantastic Mate, you need to fucking come down to the festival <laughs> the streets are not suitable for 2000 trees to be clear <laughs> ah Tom I try my best with this guy I try my best yeah you can't you're just trying to freshen up his festival Try to freshen up. I mean, well, you let, we'll have a beer, the three of us, because um, I'm assuming on the Thursday night of 2000 Trees, Tom, you'll be there with Better Lovers, and Gav has promised to come down. So, yeah, let's yeah. we'll see. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna freshen this. We're gonna freshen this lineup. Oh, okay, right, fair enough. If he's not gonna take my the ratings, I mean, you, listen, uh, uh, 2000 Trees fans, I want to see in the comments. The ratings would be fantastic. You can't dislike the ratings. What a fucking fantastic live band, also. And sleep, Tom. There is no doubt that James is going to offer you more money than I'm going to offer you, right? So is this going to come down to purely the time of the schedule when they can land in the UK if they ever do land in the UK again? Is that, am I losing this arm wrestle with a big man? You know, I, I think as much as I'd love to say there's a big strategy involved, I think it'll come down to timing of when and if they want to work and how it fits. 
you know you think when you get a that it's not their primary source of income or their driver anymore it's when they want to be creative and and that's what will we'll come down to so ultimately one of you might have a lucky day and the other one will be pissed off James, will we still well, be it's, it's actually more fun if they play Damnation to me because then I can just go and have a nice time. And <laughs> I was, I was going to say, that. are we still going to be friends, James, if they end up playing Damnation? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we're absolutely fine. Just to be clear, Tom, I'm ready to make an offer probably tomorrow. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, just to be clear, Tom, I am not competing with James's offers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what, I, all I can guarantee is the offer will get to the band. Yeah. Great. Okay. And, uh, Fantastic. Right, before we go into picking our records, uh, a quick shout out to our good friend Lou of Lou's Brews. Um, Tom, do you like a hot sauce? Do you like a hot sauce? Yeah, man. I'm from a bit of Mexican. Right, well, I don't, I'm sure he, he, he might have a Mexican styled on there. His uh, sauces, as James Scum, absolute banging. Still running with the Pod 15 to get 15% off all orders. That's not now just for fresh orders or new orders. So get yourselves involved with that. While you're at it, if you've got any spare change, get yourself at damnationclothing.com, get yourself some nice T-shirts like the one I'm wearing here. It'd be fantastic. I'd appreciate it. Me and James make no money for this podcast, so I'd like to at least make some money from it. And <laughs> that would be deeply appreciated. Like, subscribe. Lou's asked me to actually go and hit, hit up his accounts as well, Instagram, Facebook. Give that guy a like and buy some of his sauces. Now, on the record, Tom, you're the guest honour. Get started with what you're recommending for the people. I mean, I not one song, but the 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 only the first and only Battle Lovers EP. Um, I mean, the record is in the works, but I mean, yeah, that EP. I mean, I know they come from a pedigree of people that have done amazing work, but I think their first UK shows were just insanity and. That they are one of the tightest bands I've ever seen. So I think the songs are great. Um, I think that EP is, if you haven't listened to it already, it's you have to give it a chance. It's just incredible. And for the um, for those who don't know the background of Better Lovers, which band was that? So we've got three members that were in Every Time I Die, one member that was in Dillinger, and Will Putney is a very successful uh, producer. And in... Fit for an autopsy. Very good. And where would they be able to see such a band? Two thousand trees. Well, I mean, we've done a lovely bit. Of, I, I have my business partners don't know this actually, but I've done a lovely little double bit of business where Better Lovers are playing at Two Thousand Trees on the Thursday, and on the Wednesday night, which clashes with Two Thousand Trees, I've got them in Bristol. So, so I am in a field while Miles is working in Bristol. Lovely. I mean, it's like a it's like a double, double earner. And then, and then we all this get. This was my way around your exclusivity clause. You yeah. know the show. <laughs> it, is, it is the best way to get around the exclusivity. Clause. It's not exclusive if you also put them on yourself, James. Yeah, James, what have you got for this? Um, well, I've got two festivals, so I'm going to choose one band for each festival. Sorry to be annoying. Um, so, if you're an arc tangent goer, I would recommend if you haven't already checked out Elder, the. The album I'm re going to recommend is called Reflections of a Floating World, and it's from 2017. And this, how I, I love this album so much. 10 out of 10 album. Um, for fans of, like, if you're Crack the Sky era Mastodon fan, then this album is the album for you. Um, one of Tom's bands, Elder, absolutely amazing. Um, and if you're more of a 2000 Trees goer, Spanish love songs. So this, Spanish love songs do not play the sort of music that I actually would normally listen to. But I absolutely love Spanish love songs. I think they're fucking amazing. Um, and, and they're not the most recent album. The one before, Brave Face, it's called Brave Face is Everyone, is, again, it's 10 out of 10 album. It's every single song is an absolute rager. Gav, you should check them out. Um, they're, it's quite a weird sell because they're writing bangers, but it's very, very, um, the lyrically very, very sort of down and sad and depressing but the songs are like uplifting so it's just this weird um weird mix um they're they're amazing we booked i think we had them confirmed for 2000 trees during covid and 
it got cancelled and then it's taken us until now to get it back on again. So but from Spanish what, Love Songs, great band. From what I have heard the Spanish Love Songs, I would also challenge that, that they're on the BBC Radio 1 rock show or Kerrang. They're all over Kerrang, mate. Oh, well, I, would, I know about Kerrang then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'll take it. The, the Manchester Orchestra pick from last week or the week before went down a treat. So I'm going to I'm going to stick with that sort of very emotive, clever singer songwriter Julian Baker, who Tom also represents in books. Absolutely phenomenal artist. This isn't. I mean, I'm picking a song called Appointments, which has got 25 million Spotify plays. So I'm not trying to be like, uh, here's what here's a breaking band. It's that same song was also used in Netflix Athlete A, so you might recognise it from from that. It's a, I mean, it's a deeply emotional, deeply moving track about her fractured relationship and seeking help, uh, professional help to to deal with it. It's kind of a beautiful voice against the most minimalistic sort of guitar and piano, and it just builds and builds and builds. It's it's incredible. If you like that Manchester Orchestra um, shout out, then Julian Baker is another absolute pick. And obviously I'm completely out of touch with 2000 Trees because I'd love to have seen somebody like Julian Baker play and sit there and have a cry in the main stage. But clearly it's just mosh pits all day at 2000 Trees. So I can't wait to get, get the top off and start a crowd surfing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, to be fair, to be fair, I have uh, been backstage at a show debating with Julian for a an hour or two about the best Alkaline Trio record. So she's definitely in the lane. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, she did. Listen, guys, that was fantastic. Tom, thank you so much for giving us the time and giving us the side of, the side of the argument from the from the agents. Uh, you were you were, it was more gentle with us than I was expecting there, James. Yeah, that was not it was really good, Tom. we we do appreciate it. I hope everyone uh, yeah got the other side of the story. I think you you put it across really well. Well, uh, I mean, the only comment I'll say to anyone on the internet is uh, when we announce tours, less of the, uh, you know, the UK is more than England and <laughs> European tour is only three countries. We're trying out. <laughs> Until next time, gents. Thank you very much. Yes. See you.